please welcome the President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, Mr. Fred Kemp. So uh, this has been an incredible day. So first and foremost, we're winding down. This is uh, the penultimate uh, uh, sort of session, and then with uh, Secretary Albright closing. But first of all, uh, for all the staff that have worked here, for the consortium members, for Atlantic Council, GMF, Munich Security Conference, and all the teams, please give a big round of applause. This has really been incredible. Um, so. Um, uh, this is the a session, Stronger Together, Allies in an Era of Great Power Confrontation. So we have left no small conversation. This is a big conversation. We all agree that we've gotten into an era, a new era of great power competition. Secretary Mattis talked about that in testimony. Others have talked about it. Uh, the Secretary General of NATO today in front of Congress said that what's kept NATO uh, relevant, made it the most enduring, uh, most successful alliance, is when the world changes, NATO changes with it. Is NATO behind the curve in this global change, new era of global competition? If it is behind the curve, what should it do? And we're, we've got some great panelists I'm going to bring out here in a second to talk about that. Among all the things in this day, uh, a star-studded program featuring top officials, experts, thinkers on NATO, um, the Secretary General, well, first of all, this is a rock venue, uh, so, uh, uh, but I think the rock and roll star today, the Mick Jagger of NATO, was the Secretary General in Capitol Hill. I mean, he re you can really put hashtag NATO rocks uh, next to what happened up there, but we also love that we've been the, the anthem here. This is a great venue to send a message of, of a new NATO. I, the Secretary General of NATO had so many standing ovations, I thought it was an aerobics class. Oh, come on, it was funnier than that. Um, <laughs> and and, 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 thanks, and thank, thanks to our audience for making this truly interactive and engaging. Uh, our alliances and partnerships are not institutions alone. They're also people. And they get their sustainability by the buy-in and the interest of all of you around this room. Uh, so we'll, uh, we, we must keep having, we, we'll keep having uh, these sorts of conversations. So... Let me bring out uh, our, um, our three speakers uh, to speak on this issue set. So first of all, I'm honored to be joined by Minister Jacek uh, Chapotevich, Chapotovich, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister. Very good to have you here. Uh, the, uh, I'm very happy to uh, invite out Kyron Skinner, Senior Advisor, Secretary of State, and Director of Policy Planning, U.S. Department of State. Uh, and then finally, uh, Constanze Stelzenmüller, uh, Robert Bosch, Senior Fellow for Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. So thank you for being here today. Hi, Fred. Um, so one, one of the things, as I said, that marks uh, the, uh, the, the ability to adapt uh, um, is, uh, is that somehow through leadership, NATO, when it needed to get through the Cold War, when it had to make, it, it, it was born after the Berlin airlift, 12 members in the beginning, it's gone through the crises that the Secretary General talked about. Uh, after the Cold War, people started to think, well, is it going to adjust? Is it going to stay alive? You heard a uh, saying, uh, uh, well, it, it, a lot were against enlargement. Some were for enlargement. Uh, I was at the Wall Street Journal then. The Wall Street Journal editorial page really led a fight from the media in favor of enlargement. <coughs> I would argue that if NATO had not enlarged at that time, it would have lost its relevance. Then we talked about NATO out of area or out of business. It went out of area. It didn't go out of business. Now I think the question is, what era are we going in now? And what is it NATO needs to do uh, to adapt yet again? My own view, uh, and Damon Wilson gave some testimony, uh, the EVP of the Atlantic Council yesterday at the House, uh, is that there has to be stronger global links. 
uh, if we're in an era of new global competition, there are 40 global partners Secretary General talked about, it would make sense to deepen those global links in some way or form. Some people would like it more formal, some would like it less formal, but is that what, what we have to do? One thing we know is we're back to an era of this great power competition. Revisionist Russia has continued its conventional and hybrid provocations to NATO's east and challenges uh, the stability of European security. But now, in the last couple of weeks, we see a pretty provocative show around Venezuela. What is that all about? Uh, China increasingly asserts uh, its military might and its economic and technological might. Um, uh, the United States has defined China for the first time as a strategic competitor. The European Union defined China as a systemic rival. Uh, the French defense minister was at the Atlantic Council a few days ago, two times used the word threat in, in, on behalf of China. But, you know, what does NATO do about that? So um, the alliance is uh, what I would say is a de defining moment. So I'm going to go to these three speakers for an initial uh, um, response to their thoughts on this issue and with a specific question to each of them. And, uh, and, and if you can keep, we've got, we, we're going to have to wrap up in, gosh, 23 minutes or so. So I'm, I'm going to shut up now, ask really quick questions, and then let's be as brief as we can and try to get to the audience if we can as well. Uh, so, Mr. Minister, uh, how in the Polish situation, where you have uh, uh, all sorts of talks about greater U.S. presence uh, and more lasting U.S. presence in Poland, how are you looking at this new era? of greater power uh, competition. And how much do you focus on that in Poland? That's right, that's right. You are right. It is also um, uh, emerging again traditional threat for Poland. It is important that we face, we faced uh, during uh, Cold War threat from Soviet Union. Today, Russia, it's a main threat to Central and East European countries. So for us, traditional role of NATO function, which is common defense is crucial, but at the same time we also uh, observe new kind of uh, threats, hybrid, cyber, terrorism. So we have to demonstrate our solidarity with our allies uh, to also be present in the Middle East, in the south of Europe. There is a migration, there is a terrorism, uh, what, I, what I mentioned. But generally I agree with the um, assessment that there is a new global competition, but at the same time it is a uh, Mm, repetition of the geopolitical context. So for alliance to be united, you need uh, external threat. And now we have this threat, which is first Russia again, also the evolu there is an evolution of the vision of the chi relations with China, as it was mentioned by you and also by Heiko Maas. It's a rival, but also it could be long-term threat. So in this context, what is important, I think, to maintain unity among the West, democratic, free countries, to be united in order to properly face these new challenges, old and new challenges. For Poland, as a result of our geopolitical location, American presence is crucial for our security. Threat perception is particular in our this part of the word Central Europe, different than in France or Southern Europe. So uh, we, for us, transatlantic links, bond, transatlantic bond is very important. But I'm ver very glad that it was also mm, mentioned uh, and underlined by Secretary General Stoltenberg to, uh, in today's speech that this transatlantic unity is crucial. There is also a danger of kind of a loosening contacts between European allies and, and, and the United States and Canada, but we are definitely for maintaining these links and to, ma to maintain unity of the alliance, which is the only way we can be successful in facing the challenges. So uh, very briefly, Mr. Minister, if you're looking at the China question and the Russia question, maybe the Russia question, on a scale from one to 10, between not unified and really unified, where do you think NATO is on Russia, and where do you think NATO is, or the NATO countries, maybe not NATO as an institution, on China? So as far as Russia is concerned, we are quite united, uh, because it is also, um, there is an evidence, we introduced sanctions, 
we do not accept aggressive policy of Russia vis-a-vis -vis first Georgia, 10 years ago, uh, Ukraine, Syria, you mentioned Venezuela. It is the very negative role of Russia in the world. And there is uh, understanding that we have to be united. Of course, there are countries, I just want to refer to the presentation of Heiko Maas just uh, half an hour ago or 15 minutes ago. Some countries think about maintaining dialogue with Russia as uh, crucial for our security. I agree with that, but at the same time, we cannot accept breaking uh, uh, of international law and uh, invasion of our country. So this is a traditional threat, threat to sovereignty of our immediate neighbor, which is Ukraine. As far as China is concerned, there are more divergent uh, opinions, but I observe last month uh, uh, better understanding of the, uh, of the challenge uh, China creates. But there are different, so to say, kind of level of cooperation with China. There is an economic side, but there is a growing awareness of the uh, potential uh, dan dangerous relations and being de too much dependent on Chinese, so to say, technology in some aspects. So there is also a growing um, understanding of that seriousness of that situation. So our answer is from Poland, from Central Europe, maintain transatlantic links. For Poland, definitely. Relations with the United States are first. Then we can talk about Russia. For some European countries, Nord Stream 2 is an example, maintain uh, business, doing business, at the expense of geopolitical, so to say, um, situation, it is not very much welcome. So there are some differences, but we try to be united, and we've yeah. been successful in that. We'll, we'll bring North Stream to you in a minute, Constanza. So, Kyron, first of all, uh, congratulations on bringing out uh, the NATO policy planners t this week. I thought that was just, uh, you, know, you brought them over to the Atlantic Council. It was an amazing meeting and symbolically I think it was terribly important. So thank you so much for doing that. It was a big deal. Uh, the, um, uh, I wonder if you, you, you've done a lot of thinking about uh, the Trump doctrine, quote unquote. Uh, you know, is there a Trump foreign policy doctrine? And if there is, where does NATO fit in that? Uh, as you know, he, in Europe, his points of view and approaches to NATO are sometimes quite controversial. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, you see the Secretary General, you see what's happened with boots on the ground, you see what's happened with spending. And so there's a little bit of a mixed message, but it'd be very interesting to hear how you think NATO fits into a, 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 a Trump foreign policy doctrine. I think NATO is the... Um, big case for the Trump doctrine, and much of it, I think, has been developed around the idea of um, how NATO goes into the future. Are we allowed to stand? You can stand. You can walk. Thank you. you can do I think I want to be able to look at the colleagues yeah. here. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say, above all, it is so important that the Atlantic Council, the German Marshall Fund, and the Munich Security um, um, Conference have come together for this event. Track two, as I was saying, and um, with all of the planners of NATO, some from the EU, um, it's become a lot more important in, this, in the 21st century than perhaps we know. Because working with our track two partners to face the challenges that you talked about is central to those of us in government. We actually cannot do it alone. And I think the Trump doctrine recognizes that we need those who are on the outside of government and who can say things that um, diplomats like me can't say. I'm a professor by trade, so it's a little hard for me to rein myself in, but we need track two to do the work that um, will happen to preserve NATO. The Trump doctrine, I think, speaks to some of the challenges that NATO has faced in recent years. Um, one, um, the president has as a pillar of his thinking the idea that national sovereignty is the core unit of analysis in the international system. Now, I know for some in the EU who've pulled sovereignty and who see it a bit differently that there's a concern that the U.S. Um, doesn't recognize or support um, international groupings that aren't like our own, but that's not the case. What we're really trying to say is that the nation state is where we think, in this administration, um, you can find prosperity, um, the best economic um, policies and opportunities for people 
It doesn't mean that multilateral institutions don't matter. But in a hierarchy, inter the nation state is really important for the future of the international system. That's one pillar. So it means that NATO is important, but also there will be times that we have some disagreements. Nothing in the Trump doctrine suggests that we are leaving um, inter mul the multilateral frameworks. But we are saying, how do we right-size them? How do we make sure that they represent um, the national interest um, of the various nation states. A second pillar is burden sharing. And we've talked a lot about that. There's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of days, and there will be, I think, for the rest of the week, this NATO week in Washington, about burden sharing. It doesn't mean that everyone gives the, um, the exact dollar amount, but what they can do in increased numbers for collective defense. That matters because I think it sends to um, potential challengers um, like Russia, that we are working together. Defense spending matters because it means that you're putting more into R&D, that you're developing exotic technologies in this era. Um, so all of these principles are connected back to, I think, core aspects of NATO that will strengthen, um, not um, we, um, weaken NATO. There, there are many more that I could talk about, but I think this gives you a sense of what I think the Trump Doctrine does to relate to um, the, the, the NATO alliance. And I think it's significant that NATO has survived everything you said, Fred. Um, the idea of um, out of area or out of business, it survived the 1980s with the INF deployments. We've had crises in NATO um, at various times, but it's the crisis that you face in a mature family. And that's actually what NATO is. It's the world's oldest and most um, successful security alliance. Um, so, a brief follow-up for, for you, Kyron. Um, uh, Vice President Pence was here, and I think uh, the two I points... I missed those remarks. <laughs> well, the, the two things, two areas where I think he, uh, quote-unquote, made news, or at least uh, people took uh, notice here, were Germany, uh, where he was very tough about German spending and defense spending, but extremely tough on North Stream 2. Uh, and th a person who believes in national sovereignty, don't you just say, well, that's their sovereign choice. If they want to make themselves dependent on Russia for energy, that's their business. Uh, so if he believes in sovereignty, why not that? Uh, and then the second part of that is, uh, uh, I, by the way, I agree more with Pence than I, but uh, with the, on that issue. But the, uh, the second issue is, um, uh, is Turkey, S-400s, no go, you're not going to get F-35s. In the morning, the Turkish foreign minister said, it's, it's a closed deal, we're taking the S-400s, and we think we can work out a deal to get the uh, F-35s as well through a technical process. So you have, with two allies, some pretty big differences, both of them making sovereign choices that the president and the vice president are saying, we don't think you should be making. Yes, yeah, so let me respond quickly to that one. Um, I think on the issue of Nord Stream 2, it's a good example of um, trying to test and develop um, the Trump Doctrine. I like to say that the Office of Policy Planning at the State Department, which is the in-house think tank, our job is to take the president's hunches and instincts and turn them into hypotheses. In the case of Nord Stream 2, uh, we do understand the German arguments um, that they're making, and we're making different ones. Um, we're asking nations to put their interests first, but that doesn't mean that we can't try to persuade um, our allies to think differently about their interests or align their interests to the common challenges and the ways that we see them. So I think it's, it's, of course, the Trump Doctrine is open for a debate about things. It doesn't mean that every issue is immediately settled. And I think this is one where we need to have a deeper conversation with our German colleagues and allies around um, um, national interest. Mm and the challenge, um, challenges that we face, especially um, in, in Russia, which is really a near abroad for Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, uh, sorry yes, if I may please. add to that, because please. it is not a sovereign cho choice of Germany, it is broader context, European Union. Mm -hmm. You have to think also about sovereignty of Ukraine. What will be the effect of Nord Stream 2 
on sovereignty of Ukraine, other countries. So there was a decision of the Council of the European Union, which is against Nord Stream 2. So American position, European position, Polish position is on the one hand mm -hmm. against, and German position is mm -hmm. against European position. Mm -hmm. It is uh, very interesting to see it in that way. Mm -hmm. Energy security, you cannot guarantee it for your own country. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think in the context of your allies, of your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to diversify our uh, uh, s sources of uh, gas. For example, in Poland, it, make it, it will influence our uh, security, energy security, meaning generally security. So it is a very good test of the, uh, of the policy. I either you think about uh, relations with Russia as a first choice, or you think about your closer uh, allies. And I agree with the uh, assessment that uh, the, that project provides financial resources for Russia. Russia uses it to modernize its army mm -hmm. and threatens security of the Western world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is something in this argument used by the uh, American planners. Yes. <laughs> um, and, well, which brings us, since we couldn't ask these questions of Heiko Maas, you are going to embody the foreign minister and, and Germany as well as being Constanze. Um, so uh, what about the argument the minister has just made? You know, why should uh, the U.S. help pay for the defense of Germany while Germany is putting money into the, is becoming more dependent on Russia for energy and putting money in the pocket to modernize the Russian military against which we're threatened? So I guess the one question is that. And then the other question is, are you satisfied with where Germany is moving in a direction of one to 1 1.5 through 2025 on defense spending. Um, uh, and, uh, and is this, uh, is this uh, uh, first of all, I don't know if it's sustainable, whether it's really going to hit that, but give us your assessment on those two issues and then response to whatever else you've heard thus far. All right. Um, well, luckily, I don't represent the German government. I work at the Brookings Institution, so I'm both more at liberty to speak my mind yeah. and to try and explain what I think is happening here. Um, I'm on record with a fairly sharp uh, criticism of Nord Stream 2 that I wrote a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and a fairly sharp criticism of a failure to live up to our defense spending commitment, which was in the Financial Times this morning. So um, I am going to try and to not do the obvious thing, uh, which is just to repeat myself, mm -hmm. but to say what I think is happening here. Um, in other words, I think we should spend more on defense, and I think Nord Stream 2 is a uh, really geopolitically stupid project. Okay? Um, however, uh, I also have to say that um, in Western democracies, governments don't tell multinational conglomerates to stop operations. And it's not just a German operation. There's companies from five countries, including France, and it's the Germans who always get the grief for this. If we were to tell them to stop this uh, project, um, invoking national security, that would be a case of eminent domain and the German uh, government would be opening itself to lawsuits in the billions. That's exactly what happened after we went out of nuclear energy following the Fukushima disaster. In other words, um, by taking this maximalist line, which is you must stop the project now and rip the pipelines out of the ground, which I personally wish would happen. Yeah, I, f I would be very happy if it was just struck by lightning and the whole thing would go up in flames. I would be delighted. But to ask the German government to do that, it was to open it up to a huge, you know, 20-year uh, lawsuits in the billions. The non-maximalist position, which nobody seems to be talking about, is to tell the Germans to take their foot off the brake uh, in terms of the application of EU competition law, in paving the way for the unbundling and t picking off the tentacles of Gazprom from this. Two more points, if I may, on Nord Stream 2. Um, one, there are Eastern European countries which um, buy 100% of their energy from Russia and are not notably in any way captive of Russia. Uh, the Baltics, for example. Yeah? Um, these things do not correlate. And they also do not correlate in the German case, which is why I will say to you it is insulting to call us captive of Russia, because we're holding together the Russian sanctions consensus in Europe at a very real cost to German business. That far I will go to defend the German position on this. Yeah? I also would remind you that we begged the Americans for years to sell us NNG, and that didn't happen. 
So anyway, enough with this crap. Um, now, what was the other question? Defense spending. That's an easy one. Um, our own financial planners are saying um, we're not going to make it up to more than 1.25% until 2023. That's not what we promised. This makes us look like idiots. Guilty as charged. But <laughs> it is, I think, unfair to say that we're not doing anything. We have hugely increased de German defense spending in the past years. We are racing to meet those commitments. It, it is actually not so easy to do this kind of thing. And what we're, what we're looking at here is a situation where we have an American ally that is saying, you know, you ought to be, be able to do more without us. In other words, you need to, unlike the Libya operation where we come to your help, you need to be able to supply the backbone here. That's a different kind of force configuration than we've been asked to do in the past. That complicates the question of defense spending and force planning for the future. That's the best I can do, sorry. <laughs> that, was, that, that was excellent. So we, 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 have, we, we are compelled to end this session at 525, so I'm going to give Kyron a question to answer in two and a half minutes or less. Um, are we facing a situation where what Syria was to Obama and Russia, Venezuela is becoming to Trump and Russia? So uh, with Russia uh, ramp ratcheting up in, in Venezuela, with Maduro still hanging on, with us backing the interim presidency, are we uh, in danger of losing Maduro, uh, uh, losing, sorry, losing Venezuela, and thus having this be one of the moments that really defines the Trump administration? Fred, I used to think you were nice. <laughs> um, but that's a really hard question, yeah, and yeah. I think it's actually too early yeah. to make that assessment. Yeah. But do know we're thinking about the Russian presence very seriously, and it's ramping up. Um, and sure. the growing complicated nature of Venezuela, this is not an easy off-ramp um, for Maduro, as some would have hoped. But the glimmer of hope in all of this is the way in which um, about 50 nations quickly came together um, to um, recognize an interim regime that was um, based on democratic principles um, within the country. I think that's a story that has to um, really be amplified, that this is not just an American effort. Um, and when you look at um, our humanitarian assistance, the whole government way in which we've approached it with international partners, including um, international organizations, I think it speaks to the fact that we are um, committed to understanding how um, to bring a, a representative um, government to Venezuela, supporting the people. Um, but the issue of Russian presence in, the, in our hemisphere is more than troubling. Yeah, thank you. That's a terrific answer to close this session with. We have run out of time. Uh, and I'm sorry that I, I, I sneaked in that question with you, Karen. But to me, this is an underestimated for the Ab rest of the world, absolutely. for the alliance. And, and, and when we start thinking about the new era of global competition, uh, very often the first battlefield is unexpected. And this may be the first, the first real test of, 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 this, of, of this situation. So I want to thank, uh, even as I thank the speakers and hold your applause for them for a second, please also uh, join me in, well, let, let, let's thank the speakers for, first, let them get off, and then I'll introduce <laughs> Secretary Albright. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank 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 you.